let us go to something that is monumental. We did last week a Hasidic discourse from the Rebbe from 1981. And as I mentioned to you then, that was something that I experienced myself. I was there by that uh, Hasidic discourse, that Fabringham. As a matter of fact, it, it might have been the last uh, Hasidic discourse I heard from the Rebbe before I came to Montreal with my wife on Shlichas to come here and work in Chabad. Then it was Chabad on Peel Street. Um, so we learned that particular discourse. And as we mentioned, it's based on the previous Rebbe's Hasidic discourse that was given out for Yud Shvat, the 10th day of Shvat in 1950, which happened to be in the end, it was a printed um, Hasidic discourse that was given out. And on that day, on Shabbos morning, 7.20 in the morning, the previous Rebbe passed on. So the Rebbe based for the next 40 years a Hasidic discourse on the previous Rebbe's teachings. But of course, the first one, which was said in 1951, a year after the passing of the previous Rebbe. Now, I wasn't around. I only know the stories that I hear from Hasidim and that are written that the Rebbe did not want to take the leadership. As a matter of fact, he said, I don't, I wasn't told. I wasn't uh, given the, you know, the, 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 the power or given any sign that I should be doing this. Siddham pleaded with him. At one point, Siddham went to the oil of the previous Rebbe, the resting place of the previous Rebbe. They prayed there. And then finally, there was an indication, I guess, on high. I don't know how, because I have no idea. I'm not a Rebbe. So I have no idea what that means. Um, but um, what it does mean is that Rebbe took the mantle of leadership upon himself. But I, I think I mentioned this previously. How do we know? Where is the indication um, of the leadership is by saying a Hasidic discourse. And a Hasidic discourse is something unique for a Rebbe. In other words, Torah teachings, we all can and have to engage and give over teachings of predecessors, but also at the same time giving over teachings that we add something to it. We always have to grow in our connection. We can't just take the teachings and spew it out. We also have to be able to add some kind of unique perspective that we're giving something to the teachings. So that is something we all have to do. But a Hasidic discourse is something different. That is something that is, for a Rebbe, the Hasidim would sing a melody, a very, um, a preparation melody. The Rebbe would, uh, our Rebbe, what he did, he put his hands under the table and he knotted them with a handkerchief and as if to kind of ground these teachings that are coming from on high. It's a different sort of, um, I don't know, what, I guess, mystical connection to bring the word of God into this world, for lack of a better term. So that's a, a Hasidic discourse. So when the, when the Rebbe, by the, by the Fabri, when came Yud Shvat, and the Rebbe made a Fabring in 1951, and it was the official sort of um, acceptance of the, of the leadership, um, he was saying sikhos, talks. He was giving over talks, but he wasn't saying a he wasn't saying a Hasidic discourse. So finally, one of the older Hasidim, older than the Rebbe by several by a few decades, Rebbe was forty eight at the time, said Rebbe, ach amaimer. Chassidim warten for a mimer. The Chassidim are waiting for a mimer, for a Hasidic discourse. A mimer is the Hebrew term. And then a few minutes later, the Rebbe began. So what I want to give over today is that first Hasidic discourse. And if if time will allow, if not, maybe we'll do that tomorrow. Um, we can hear it, the original. There's a tape of it. There isn't a video of it, but there is a tape of the original discourse said in 1951 
and we can hear the Rebbe's voice. So giving, you know, sort of the background of and going through what the Rebbe expressed. And in a sense, this is like the State of the Union address, even more so. Because <laughs> State of the Union is only for the Union of the United States of America, but this is for the entire world and what is um, the mission of our generation. So without any further ado, some of the uh, ideas we already um, broached in the previous discourse, because every discourse begins the same, but then the Rebbe explains a different element of the previous Rebbe's teachings, a different chapter. There's 20 chapters, and uh, this year is chapter 11. Um, no, it's not bankruptcy. On the con, the opposite. <laughs> and um, but this is the first discourse. So the Rebbe starts at the previous Rebbe writes in his mimer, his Hasidic discourse on the day of his passing, Yud Shvat, Tavshin, Tavshin, Yud, in the year 57, 5710, which is 1950. Then he goes into Bal, Silagani right? That is the name of the Hasidic discourse of the Mimer, King Solomon, quoting from King Solomon in Ecclesiastics, he says, God says, I have come to my garden, my sister, the bride. And the Medjish explains to the garden, actually, more specifically, Gnuni, which means to my bridal path, I've come. God is saying, I'm coming to, to this world, to my bridal path the place where I was originally. Because the main divine providence or the main presence of God is in this low world. So we need to understand what does it mean that Rebbe asks, Iker Shechina, the main divine pr pr uh, presence of God. So Shechina comes from the word Shochen, which means to enclose. Just like the clothes fit the person, right? Uh, the clothes make the man, as they say. So there's different ways God's presence can be um, revealed or be expressed. There's the, exp there's the way that God is beyond. He is encompassing, right? And then their way is God is in is found within. Encompassing means he's beyond what I can fathom with my mind, beyond what my heart can appreciate. Then there is the way God fills the world. And that is a way that I can appreciate and understand, use my mind and understanding, which is true. Both are true. So when we speak about the Shekhinah, the divine presence of God that is meant to be in this world, it is meant to be in this world in a way that is to be enclosed. Not only is it not to be something beyond that we can have no access to, not only is it meant to be in this world, but it's meant to be in this world in a way, the divine presence of God in a manner that it is clothed from within, that it fits just as the closing fits the person. So likewise, the presence of God is meant to be fit to each and every one of us that we can access God's presence. Usually the word Shechina, for those who've studied Tanya, know that that refers to, anybody know? What divine attribute? What place in the divine order of things? Anybody? Malchus of Atzilus, for those who recall. Malchus is the last of the 10 divine, uh, divine attributes, which is sovereignty, kingship. In the world of Atzilus, which is the world of emanation. World of emanation, there's four worlds, three worlds that are created worlds, and then this physical world. But then there's a world that is a world of emanation that is not a creation, it's not, it's an emanation of God. 
maybe you could say like our aura. There's me, what I do, and then there's my aura. For way of a metaphor. So the world of Atsilus is like the aura that is connected with God. Just uh, uh, that's my metaphor to give to give an understanding and appreciation of that concept. So usually when we speak about the divine presence of God, we're speaking about the aura, right, uh, of God, which is Malchus of Atsilus. But the Rebbe says, no, it actually also refers as the Iker Shechina, far and above and beyond. It reaches to, the, to God himself. That the divine presence of God that we have access to in this world is to the Ein Soif, to God himself. And that's um, beyond all worlds. And that's why the main Shechina was in this world, is in this world, is in this low world um, that God comes to. Is that clear? That's the first paragraph. Any questions on that? By the way, whoever can put on their camera that we can see all the pretty faces, that would be amazing. And if you can't, that's also okay. But it just makes it the experience so much better. Okay. Now. The Shechina, as it came into this world, the divine presence of God, of God himself, and not just the aura, not just the light of God, uh, was removed from this world through the sin of Adam and Eve eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was the main departure, even though left to seven spheres above, beyond, seven heavens above. But the main leaving was the first one, Adam and Eve, through their sin of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So God's presence was began to be removed. Thank you, Simcha. Welcome. Okay. Now, that, so that's chapter two. Chapter three. So, refers to that every seventh, um, sorry, all sevenths are endeared. So the Rebbe says it, the, the phrase is not that those who are endeared are the seventh. No, all, all seventh are endeared. Now, this paragraph is an important one. I mean, they're all important. But the importance of this is the Rebbe himself is the seventh generation from the Alter Rebbe, from the founder of the Chabad movement, Shneer Zalman, Abliadi, the author of the Tanya, uh, and he's a seventh generation. But also, he doesn't make that reference here, but that is sort of, you know, Hasidim understand the, uh, the, the, the point to bring in a personal way to our generation, as we will see. So, what is the virtue of being the seventh generation that you will become endeared? Well, it's not because you chose it. It's not because you did something special, the Rebbe says. It's because the seventh, whoops, my apologies. I don't know why that's, should not be making that noise. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, seventh only because you happen to fall in the seventh generation. You happen to fall after the first, second, third, and so on to the seventh. And who was the seventh that we're making reference to over here? Is Moshe Rabbeinu. That he merited to give the Torah to the Jewish people because he was seventh. Now, what does that mean? So the seventh means that your virtue is not what you've accomplished, 
but because you come as an extension of the first. So who's the first? The first is referring to Avram Avinu, Abraham, our forefather. Because of his greatness, there are successive generations that then you come to the seventh, and the seven has an endearing position, shall we say, right? What was so great about Avram Avinu? Well, he's the first. He's the first to have sacrifice, self-sacrifice for God. Now, what does it mean he had self-sacrifice? He wasn't like Rebbe Akiva in later generations that looked to sacrifice. Like, when am I going to be able to fulfill sacrificing my life for God? Avram, Abraham didn't look for that. But he had sacrifice. How? Actually, it's interesting tying in what we learned today in Tanya. Wow. Hmm. With what we're learning here. Avraham didn't look to die for God. He looked to live for God. How? Sacrifice. What was the sacrifice? He went around. Vayikra b'shem Hashem havaya kel elam. He called out in the name of God that He is the God of God uh, God of world or. He's the God of, not of the world. He's, God is the world. world is God, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. And as the Medjur says, don't call out Vayikra Vabiyakri. He didn't just call out, but his sacrifice was that he went around to inspire others that they should call out in the name of God. That they should recognize God in their lives. That they should become closer. And this is the sacrifice. He didn't just merely enjoy his relationship with God. He didn't merely just um, do what God wanted of him. Because that's the difference between him and Noah. And that's why Noah is not the first. Because Noah did not. Uh, this is a parenthetical. That's not that it says in the Mimer and, and the discourse over here. But I'm saying that. Right? Uh, that we should have the context. The greatness is in that he called may helped others to call out in the name of God. And that we're the seventh, or Moshe Rabbeinu is seventh to the first. Now, that being said, just because we're the seventh doesn't mean, therefore, there is a limitation to that. That we're, you know, in other words, it's not because of our greatness. It's because we're the seventh in successive generations from the first. And the first was great, right? And you can't say that this is only certain individuals that have the capacity for bringing down the presence of God in this world. No, it's upon every single one of us. We all have the capacity. We all have the capability. To influence others. And that we can say to ourselves, when will my deeds, when will my actions be like, or like a, as Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Ah, don't fool yourself and think that, you know, you're going to be great, great as they, right? Because they are true greatness. However, the virtue of being the seventh to the first is that we carry on with the mission that the first one started with. And there is no um, limitations to it. Not again, not because we're great, but we're continuing a great mission from the first, and we carry it how until finally the seventh have the the mandate to bring the enclothement of God into this world, because seven generations removed it, 
seven generations, starting with Avram, the first, started to bring back down the Shekhinah, the divine presence, the oneness of God. And it's finally the seventh generation that will bring it down into this world, bring it down into this world in a manner that not that only we individually will connect to God, but we will help others that they should connect to God and that the divine presence should be drawn down to this low world, to anybody and everybody within this world. And this is something that's demanded from every single one of us, the Rebbe says, being that we are in the seventh generation and all seven are dear. Even though being the seventh is not because we didn't choose it. We didn't cho be choose to be born at this time, to be born in this generation. We didn't choose, and then it's not because of our great divine service that makes us special and endeared. Nonetheless, all seventh are endeared. We are found now on the heels of Mashiach at the end of exile, where we are going to finish and bring the divine presence of God into this world. Whew, that's powerful. That was chapter three. So the reference point, the Rebbe is speaking about us, but he's speaking in reference to, of course, the first seven, which was Moshe Rabbeinu, which is Moses. But in this chapter, it's interesting how he segues out and saying that we are the seventh generation and we have the ultimate task. So now he brings us back to, to Moshe Rabbeinu, how this um, expressed itself, how this expressed itself back in the generation of Moses. Okay. Any questions so far? Clear? Thumbs up? No? Linda? I hear Miriam. Miriam from Colorado. Anna from Manchester. Karamalka. Okay, we got Abigail. Beautiful. Darla. Katie. Great. Karen. Pablo? Yeah, I think you put it up already. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Oh, we got from Karen. Okay. It, Karen, is that Karen from LA or from Springfield? Give me another thumbs up if that's just to know. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> Look at that. Even not seeing the faces, we know who it is. And Robert also thumbs up from Boston. Ready to go. <laughs> All right. So now we 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 segue back to the the uh, idea of the divine pr the presence of God, the Shekhinah, the divine presence of God in this world, and how it was um, first brought back into this world by the seventh generation by Moshe Rabbeinu by Moses, right? Again, he was also the seventh. I mean, he's the original seventh. <laughs> right. So a concept that we've learned in the previous discourse and um, that the main revelation of godliness in this world in seventh generation and by Meshav Bena was in making a home for God. As the verse says, make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell in them, as the major says, in them, I should say in, in it. No, I will dwell in every single one of the Jewish people. In other words, through it, right, the sanctuary of God, I'll dwell in every single one of the Jewish people. Um, and this is the idea then of both. Shoshana or Shoshana fine. Oh my gosh. This is really weird. I don't know. I shut off the ringer and it's still ringing. Oh, okay. I 
think I shut it off properly. <laughs> um, so with creating the sanctuary, the presence of God, that is the idea of Basi Lagani, that I've come to my garden, to my bridal path, which is interesting because Again, this is parenthetical, the Rebbe doesn't say this here, but it's in other discourses speaking about that Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah to the Jewish people, was really a wedding between God and the Jewish people. God is the groom and Jewish people are the bride. Um, the tablets were the, uh, the ksuba, the, the marriage contract. Mount Sinai was, was the chuppah, it was the marriage canopy, Mount Sinai. Um, Moses acted on the on the on the side of the groom, God, to bring him to the wedding, and Aaron acted on the side of the bride, the Jewish people. That's all what it speaks over here. But um, just the 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 tie into the bridal chamber that God is coming to, as we learn in other places, uh, coming back to. Because he was originally here, of course, by the Garden of Eden. And this is ultimately uh, the purpose of what God created the world for, because he wants a dwelling place in this low world, in this physical low world, is where we can, um, where God wants to dwell, which we'll get to that. Uh, in other words, what do you mean in this low world? We know that there's, as we mentioned, there's higher spiritual worlds. Uh, there is the Garden of Eden. Um, there is the world of Atsilos, lofty souls that are, that are in that world. So why is it that it's this low world that God wants? Well, ultimately, it's because so is his desire, so it is. So it's beyond something that we can comprehend, but yet... There is some com comprehension to it, and it's two points. The higher worlds is really a come down for God. Like what he needs, he needs those worlds. He needs higher spiritual worlds. He needs angels. He needs souls, in uh, you know, in, that are in those worlds. It's if anything, it's a come down. Furthermore, to create this world, for those who recall in the study of Tanya, is something unique. When God created, you know, when, when we're creative, for the most part, a lot of the our creative work, not necessarily do we put our very core essence being into that creative work, you know, especially if it's not so creative, like, you know, cleaning your backyard, <laughs> raking the leaves, right? Uh, or doing the snow in Montreal, right? <laughs> Do you put your core essence into that? No, because you're just moving the snow, you know, so you could park your car in the garage and you could walk on your walkway. Your core essence is, isn't there. Why not? Because it's only a means to some end. It's not something that is an end in itself. Right? In a sense, that's what the spiritual world's above. Or only a means. I apologize. This is really... <laughs> I have to shut off my phone. <laughs> this is weird. I don't know what's going on. I always said technology has a mind of its own. <laughs> I <tutter. laughs> Either way I put it, I'm supposed to be on silent mode. <laughs> All right. As long as it doesn't silence us. And I'm including you, <laughs> not just me. So... So God in his creative process, right? Creating the spiritual worlds, it's like, I, I, you know, it's poor analogy, but excuse the analogy, just came up with it. Shoveling the snow, like, you know, your, your heart and soul's on in there. You're doing it for a means to an end. So the spiritual worlds are really a means to an end. That's why it's a come down. But creating this world, God creates from his core essence. He puts of him himself into 
this world into even the physical world that we can have now a connection to the essence of God himself. And that's what our purpose is, to reveal the core essence of God as he is found in this world. That's why, I, and, and that ever doesn't go with this, uh, I'm just, again, giving more context. And many of you know this concept because you've learned Tanya with me or with others, <laughs> right? Um, is uh, why it's not about getting brownie points and being a goody good shoe so you can get a share in the world to come, Gan Eden or you know, go to heaven, not to hell. Even though there's a truth to that, there is a truth to it, but that's not the purpose. That's where you shovel the snow or, you know, <laughs> rake the leaves, so to speak. You're only getting a, a ray, a glimmer of God there, right? How much you get of a person when you see them shoveling the snow, you're getting a glimmer of who they are. Not really a core essence. But in creating this physical world, God it does it from his very core essence. And that's why we don't run away from this world. We engage in this world. God is found in this world. And that's what the Torah and Mitzvahs, of course, are ultimately for, how to find him in this world. And that's our purpose, to make a dwelling place for God in this low world. Is that clear? Yeah? You guys are amazing. Wow. Look at that. I get thumbs up from Linda and everybody else. Just want to make sure you're all listening. Because the ones that I see, so I know. <laughs> We're listening. Oh, Abigail. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. That was chapter four. Um or five, rather. No, sorry. That was chapter I, four. Now I'm it goes just, to chapter five. Yes, I'm, go ahead, I'm Abigail. I'm so sorry to I, I just wanted to say it's hard with the kids to hold the phone the whole time. That's why the camera's off. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So. No, I have, no, I have no complaints to you or actually to anybody else that doesn't put on their camera. I'm just trying to be inspirational. That if you could, that would be amazing. That's all. <laughs> I understand that, you know, and for you, I know for sure. And I know, her, actually, as I mentioned, Abigail, to, to Simcha, to my wife, um, I'm blown away that you're here every day and coming to learn um, your uh, inspiration for me. That's for sure. She has like, uh, you know, little kids at home and uh, they're, um, they're wonderful, cute little kids. But, you know, but I'm doing focus. Many your focus your focus is definitely hard to be on learning about the shrina the divine presence of god when when you got god's kids right there <laughs> i'm doing what i find i'm doing a lot of things at the same time like laundry like cooking and paying attention to my dog because my dog is very needy uh -huh. needs, okay needs so um so i'm gonna inspire you that oh. maybe that you can do the laundry later then <laughs> I can't because I can't. I have okay. too much. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's okay. So, sorry, that was chapter four. Now we're in chapter five. Um, now, okay. So, if how then do we express? that finding of God here, of course, is generally through Torah and mitzvahs. Of course, it's generally through Torah and mitzvahs. And, and maybe, and, and Abigail, this is, uh, Abigail, this is uh, where um, you, you come in, in, uh, <laughs> in my inspiration. Uh -oh. in my oh, inspiration. Okay. <laughs> in my inspiration. In my inspiration. Because what is true pleasure to God? is when we find him in this world. How though? When we get out of our comfort zone, right? When we get out of whatever that comfort zone is, everybody has their comfort zone. I have mine, you have yours. So we can all equally give divine pleasure. 
right? Based on what our box is, right? I see everybody in a box over here, <laughs> your pictures, your names, <laughs> everybody's living in a box. <laughs> oh my gosh, look at that, <laughs> right? So the pleasure is when we get beyond that and, and, and in Hasidic terminology, that is what's called the uh, iskafia in ashafcha. Those are Aramaic words. Iskafia means to bend yourself and ashafcha means to transform yourself. Can't always transform yourself, but you can always bend yourself. In other words, you can always have a desire for something and bend and not give in to that desire. Does a desire become transformed? No, the desire is there, but you don't give in to it, right? You don't give in to it. That is um, what gives ultimately divine pleasure. Now, of course, every time you do a mitzvah, there's a connection to God, right? So to, I'm making a distinction over here. You do a mitzvah. We, uh, we started off giving tzedakah. We um, are studying Torah right now. We're doing a mitzvah, right? We're doing it 100%. And there's a bond right now we have with God Almighty through the act of doing a mitzvah. Absolutely to the core essence of God, 100%. However, this is something added now. Does that mean we gave true pleasure? Well, let's take it on human terms, right? Like, take it on human terms. When does a parent really have pleasure from their child? I don't mean in, in abusive ways, like, you know, they're always funny, so therefore you just laugh at them even though when they're being insulting to somebody, so that's abuse. You're, you're abusing your child by laughing at them being funny when you should be teaching them something, not to, to say something nasty, right? So you're, you're abusing your, your position as a parent. And others having pleasure from them because it was cute, so you laugh. No. Real joy a parent has is when? When the child goes above and beyond what they naturally would be, naturally do. This child doesn't know how to share. And they are sharing now. Wow. Thank you, Sirial Nachas. But the child that always shares and is sharing, that doesn't give you, okay, that's great. They've done well. But, you know, it's when the child is doing something above and beyond. That's where the pleasure comes. I mean, that's where sure come at least. <laughs> where do we know this from? God Almighty, because that's where he gets his pleasure. Do we connect to God when we do a mitzvah that is in our comfort zone? Absolutely. Absolutely. Not saying we're not connected to God. That's not the point. But when we're talking about finding God and making a dwelling place for him in this world, is that he has pleasure of being here connected to us that's a different statement. That's when we are able to bend ourselves. That's when we're able to transform ourselves. Transformation is obviously much more difficult, but bending and not giving in to your natural inclination is something that we can all do. It's called the scafia. Actually, something we learned about the vainity, right? If you recall, right? The, 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 the tzaddik transforms their animal soul. The Baini doesn't transform the animal soul, but what does Baini do? Folks, you remember? What does the Baini do? Never gives in to his animal soul. Oh, I'm sorry, Pablo, you were going to say. Go ahead. Yeah, he, sub he subdues his animal soul. Never, never it subdues it, exactly. Doesn't transform it, but subdues it. Doesn't give in to it, exactly. Right? That's his scafia. That is uh, not allowing it to um, have its... Um, control over me now we can also do as have had some points in some ways and so you know in some uh, in some manners but generally this is the idea of um drawing making a dwelling place for who the essence of god atmos and muhus ain't safe is the terminology atmos and the word etzim, the essence, mahus, core essence. I don't, <laughs> I don't know exactly in English how to translate. Um, of ain't uh, safe, of the limitlessness of God that is funneled into this world in a manner 
that fits this world, fits me, fits us in a way that we're connected to. Whoa. Okay. Tomorrow we're going to continue with this thought. Uh, we did the first five chapters. Tomorrow we're going to do the last uh, four chapters. And I guess it's tomorrow. Should we listen a little bit today and a little bit tomorrow to the Rebbe? Or should we listen tomorrow? A little today? Who wants a little today? You know, we got a couple of minutes. Okay. Let me do this. Okay. We're going to get a little treat here. This is the beginning of the Mimer. Can you hear? You hear? Yes. Yes. Okay, that was just the uh, little from the beginning. I'm going to, um, tomorrow I'm going to try to find certain parts. You can hear very uh, heavy, uh, you can hear cries from the Rebbe when he's saying certain things. Um, very powerful. So um, we will uh, continue to finish off the, the discourse. Here are some more points. And in the meantime, can I have everybody say hello? Can you put on your, uh, whoever is capable of putting on their screen now, just so we could say goodbye. And I could take a little video of saying everybody, um, Shavua Tov or Good Vach. <laughs> everybody, whoever can, please do. And just take a moment, say Shavua Tov, everybody. Shavua Tov. Beautiful. That was appreciated. <laughs> now I know you're really there. All right, folks. So we will continue tomorrow. Um, a message that we got today was, what was the message? Abraham is the first. We continue the mission. What is the mission? Not only that we are connected to God Almighty, but we have to bring that to others and have them connected. So tomorrow, I'm sure everybody's going to have one friend with them on this class. <laughs> yes, I'm terrible. But oh, look at that. People are already hanging up on me now. <laughs> All right. If you can, folks, try to get some a friend, someone, inspire them that they should join us, if not tomorrow, at least throughout the week. All right. Thank you very much. This has been wonderful. God bless you all. Thank you, Rabbi. Hey, thank you, Rabbi. Thank, thank, thank you, Rabbi. You well. Bye -bye. Thank you, Rabbi. Hey. God bless. Have a good day. Good day. Shavuot Tova. Good Tovach.